Hello again, physics friends here with today. We're going to talk about oscillations about a stable point. And in particular, we're going to illustrate the key idea using uh, the simple harmonic oscillator or simple harmonic motion, SHM. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about a mass oscillating on a spring of stiffness K about an equilibrium position um, that we'll call X equals zero. So we're going to have our X coordinate be a displacement from equilibrium. And in that case, we know that the spring force is given um, in the, no, this is one dimensional, but the spring force is given as minus K times the displacement from equilibrium. And we know that this force is conservative. Uh, the force depends only on position and the work done is path independent. Um, and therefore we should be able to express this force equivalently as the gradient of a potential. In this case, it's a potential in 1D, okay? Um, we know from previous work that this potential can be written as 1 half kx squared, okay? So our goal today is to understand a little bit about the meaning of k, uh, what do these potential energy curves look like, and how do they connect with more general potentials, okay? So if, if we draw out, um, if we draw out a potential energy curve that um, in this case we see that we have a parabola right the function u is parabolic and it goes right through the origin so we'll have a graph that looks something like this our graph is u of x as a function of x and it's going to look something like this this is a par parabola um, and what are some of the properties of the parabola? Okay, well, um, number one, if we take a derivative of u with respect to x, we get um, k times x. And if we evaluate that derivative at the origin, we know we get zero. So that tells us that we expect the parabola to have zero slope at the origin, which indeed it does. That's good. How about the second derivative? Well, that is just k, no matter where you are, right? So you don't even have to evaluate the second derivative at the origin. The curvature of the parabola is constant. <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's a key idea, that k is equal to the curvature of the graph. Okay, and it's constant. All right. So... If you have a very stiff spring, then your potential energy curve will have a very steep slope, a very large curvature. So this is a large K. And if you have a very soft spring, um, then you expect to have a potential that's much softer, much more flat. And that would correspond to a small K, small curvature, and so on. Okay. So notice that um, we can think about this in terms of force too, right? If you have a stiff spring, you're going to have a large force for a given displacement. And if we think about the force as the, the gradient of the potential, if you have a stiff spring, your slope is very large. Your corresponding force will have a large magnitude. Whereas if you have a um, soft spring, you're going to have a shallow slope, a small slope. Therefore, you need a larger displacement in order to get the same force. We're gonna be using this idea of curvature and second derivative a lot going forward when we try to understand oscillations about stable equilibria. And so rather than writing out d squared u dx squared every time, we're gonna introduce um, the prime notation as a spatial derivative. So two spatial derivatives, d squared u dx squared, we'll write as u double prime. And if we want to evaluate um, that second derivative at some specific position x naught, then we'll write it like this, u double prime x naught. That's equivalent to writing out d squared u dx squared evaluated at x equals x naught. Okay, so we're gonna use from now on this shorter hand notation, u double prime. Okay, so what we can say then using for a spring um, is that at these equilibrium point, which is a stable equilibrium point because the curvature is positive, um, we have for a spring, 
we have x equals 0 is a stable equilibrium. Um, we know it's an equilibrium because u prime at x equals 0 is 0. That tells us there's 0 slope at the origin. And we know it's stable because u double prime at the origin, um, which is k, is positive. Okay, So we have a stable equilibrium. What else... Um, what else can we learn about um, the system from this value k, from this curvature? Okay. Well, one other thing that we can we know about um, of mass on the spring is the equation of motion, right? We know that, we've seen this many times now, that the acceleration is given by minus k over m times the displacement, right? Which we can write out uh, a solution for this um, in the following way, but first we're going to define a term omega naught. We're going to define that as square root of k over m. And when we make that definition, we can then write very nicely that the position is a periodic function. In the following way, where the angular frequency of that periodic function is dependent on k, the curvature of the potential. And what we're going to see in general is even if your potential energy is not an exact parabola, even if it's not exactly a parabola, near a stable equilibrium, you can approximate the potential as parabolic. So if you have some potential that looks like this, okay, near any one of these equilibria that are stable, you can approximate the system as parabolic. Okay, And each of those parabolas will have a stiffness, or a k, a second derivative, a curvature, and that curvature will tell you about the frequency of oscillations um, about that equilibrium. So we can learn about the oscillation frequency for a particle in a one-dimensional potential, even if it, the potential itself is not a perfect parabola, uh, but near one of these um, stable equilibrium points, we can approximate the potential as parabolic and look at the frequency of oscillations. And the frequency of oscillations, as we will see, can be written as the effective angular frequency for oscillations near equilibrium. We can write that as the square root of k effective over the mass of the system. Now notice the similarities here. We're, we're leveraging the idea um, that for a mass on a spring, that angular frequency is square root of k over m, where k is like the stiffness of the spring, and the stiffness of the spring determines the curvature of the potential energy graph. Here, we do not have exactly a mass on a spring, but near this equilibrium, we approximate the potential as parabolic, which is like a mass on a spring potential. And that parabolic potential, or approximately parabolic potential, will have some effective spring constant given by the curvature of the potential near this stable equilibrium and we can therefore figure out the frequency of the oscillations about the stable equilibrium using the curvature. Um, k effective um, is going to be related to but not always exactly equal to um, the second derivative of the potential evaluated at the equilibrium point. Um, but it's not always exactly u double prime. And we'll see um, that play out in, in our next example, where we look at a pendulum oscillating in a plane, which is not exactly the same as a mass on a spring, but it's very close to it. And we'll, we'll see how we can make approximations to make these two systems uh, look quite equivalent. So to see how we can use this idea of approximating a non-parabolic potential as a parabola, let's look at the potential energy of a pendulum, a planar pendulum, in which we have a mass at the end of a string of, of length r, and the mass oscillates back and forth in the plane of the page. We have as our parameter an angle phi that goes from the vertical up to the current location of the string. And we're going to define our potential energy to be zero right up at the ceiling. You can do that. You could also choose, if you'd like, to define your potential energy to be zero when the pendulum hands vertically, but we'll take this convention and, and play that one out. 
Okay, so what does that, where does that leave us? Our, our goal here is to write down the potential energy as a function of this angle phi and to make a plot of that potential. And we want to learn something about the oscillation frequency of this pendulum uh, by approximating the potential as a parabola near the stable equilibrium. Okay, so what is the potential when the pendulum is hanging straight down? Well, in that case, we are going to be a length or distance r below our reference position. And we know the gravitational potential energy associated with an object of mass m is given by mg times a height relative to a reference position. This time we are below the reference position, so we have less potential energy than zero. Equivalently, we can look at the potential energy when the object is at some angle phi. Okay. And what do we have in that case? Well, we're not going to be a length or a distance, a full distance r below the horizontal, below our reference position. Instead, we're going to be a distance r times the cosine of phi. So we need to update our plot here a little bit. We'll say this angle is r cosine phi. Okay. And I'll get rid of this label r. So what that tells us is at some angle phi, the potential is minus mg times the depth below um, our reference plane, which is r times the cosine of phi. <clears throat> so that specifies our potential, right? We have a potential that depends on phi. It's equal to minus mg r cosine of phi, and we can make a plot of that. So let's do so. Okay, and let's consider the range minus pi over two to plus pi over two. That's um, having the pendulum go all the way up to the ceiling on either end. Okay. When the angle phi is zero, the potential here is minus mgr. And that plot takes on a cosine curve that would extend up beyond, uh, the, beyond on the positive y-axis like that if the particle went above the ceiling. All right, so why don't we then try to understand something about this uh, potential energy curve? It's not a parabola, right? But we can approximate it as a parabola near the origin, okay? So what would the, that approximate parabola, what would be the properties of that approximate parabola? Well, let's learn something about this potential energy function. So I'll just copy it up here again for reference. And let's look at derivatives. So let's look at the first derivative. We'll call that du d phi, which I'll call u prime. That's going to be mgr times the sine of phi. Derivative of cosine is minus sine. The minuses cancel. And we can verify that indeed u prime at phi equals 0 is equal to 0. Check, because sine of 0 is 0. So we have an equilibrium point at the origin. We already see graphically that it's going to be a stable equilibrium point because <clears throat> our potential energy curve is concave up, but let's just verify that. Let's take the second derivative of the potential, which would be mgr times cosine of phi. Like so. And if we evaluate the second derivative at the origin, we get mgr. As described elsewhere, we should be able to write our potential as an expansion about the equilibrium. So we'll write it as the value at phi equals 0 plus the first derivative at phi equals 0 times a shift 
delta phi from equilibrium plus one half times the curvature at phi equals zero times the square of the shift from the equilibrium um, and so on and we know that the first derivative of the potential is zero okay and so we can renormalize or reshift over this shift over the constant piece and absorb that in the potential in the following way u phi minus u phi of zero and we can write that as one half u double prime of zero times delta phi squared. What does this do when we shift over the constant term? That just takes our potential energy curve and shifts it up vertically so that um, we have a curve like that that goes through the origin. And because the absolute value of the potential does not affect anything, only the gradient of the potential is relevant, you are free to shift potentials up and down at will. That's equivalent to saying, well, we could have taken our origin for potential to be down here. That could have been our u equals zero. And then we would increase our potential as we went above that point. So it's equivalent. Okay. We have an expression for this u double prime. We know it's mgr. So we have one half mgr times delta phi squared. And we want to express this um, we want to compare this with 1 half kx squared, which is that comparable expression for a mass on a spring. So the k term is going to be the quantity in front of the object that has units of the length. Here we have an object of units of um, angle, so we need to write that in a slightly different way. We'll write that as 1 half mg1 over r times r delta phi quantity squared. Now we have a term that's like our x, and we have a term then that's like our k. So this mg over r is like our spring stiffness. And that quantifies um, how, um, how curved is this potential energy curve near the stable equilibrium position. Now we know that the um, resonant frequency near equilibrium is given by the square root of k effective, the effective spring constant of our system divided by m. We can then put in our effective spring constant of mg over r, divide that by m, and we find that our angular frequency should be square root of g over r. And in a minute we'll confirm that um, against another analysis that we'll use, which is the analysis of um, Newton's second law. We've just found that the angular frequency, the effective angular frequency for the pendulum near the equilibrium point is given by square root of g over the length of the pendulum. And our goal here is to figure out um, how we can arrive at the same result in using, using Newton's second law. And in fact, uh, we want to show that we get the same result. So what we can do is draw out our system and think about um, the system in polar coordinates. Um, so we have the r hat direction, wow, r hat direction, and the phi hat direction, like so. And uh, we have a couple forces that are acting on this pendulum. We have a force of gravity down, and we have a tension force radially inward. Okay. Um, we can do Newton's second law in the phi direction, uh, which tells us that the acceleration in the phi direction is 1 over m times the sum of the forces in the phi direction. There is only one force in the phi direction, and that is given by mg sine of theta. So the acceleration in the phi direction involves r phi double dot plus 2 r dot phi dot. That's got to equal 1 over m times the sum of the forces. As I said, that's simply mg times the sine of phi pointing in the minus phi hat direction. In other words, it uh, works to decrease the angle phi.
All right, we get some cancellation. We get that M's canceling. We also know in this problem that the R coordinate is constant at capital R, so that R dot and R double dot are zero. So this simplifies our expression on the for the acceleration. And on the right-hand side, we then have capital R, phi double dot, is equal to minus g sine of phi. That ends up with the following equation of motion, phi double dot equals minus g over r sine of phi. That is a non-linear differential equation because the coordinate phi appears um, in this non-linear function sine of phi. But as you are well aware by now, um, for small oscillations, meaning the angle phi much, much less than one radian, for example. The sine of phi is approximately equal to phi, and what that buys us is a simplification in the equation of motion such that we end up with the following differential equation. Well, this looks a whole lot like a mass on a spring. In, in fact, it's exactly the same mathematical foundation or structure as mass on a spring, so that the angle as a function of time can be written as in the following way, as a periodic function, sine or cosine omega naught t, where omega naught is the square root of g over r, the coefficient in front of phi here. That's exactly what we found um, using energy arguments and oscillations around the potential. And in fact, um, this approximation that we're making here for phi much, much less than 1 is exactly the same approximation that we made in the previous um, argument with energy when we said that we're going to restrict ourselves to considering uh, the area near equilibrium and if we stay close enough to equilibrium, the potential is approximately parabolic, and um, that's exactly equivalent to saying as long as you consider small oscillations, meaning you stay close to angles that are near equilibrium, then sine of phi is equal to phi. So both of those approximations end up in the same place, and we find um, using two different techniques the same result that the resulting angular frequency for small oscillations about the equilibrium of hanging down vertically is equal to square root of g over r. So I hope this has given you a flavor of how to use potential energy graphs as a way to study um, motion. Even if you don't solve for the motion in general, you can still talk about um, things like uh, frequency of oscillation near equilibrium and stable equilibria and so on. So that's it for now. But until next time, take care and be well.